Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it, stick it out of it, sells, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. It's another episode of The Business Side of Music. Today, Christopher Caliendo is with us. He is the founder of Caliendo World Music Publishing. And we're going to have a conversation about kind of the music scene and how to educate the musician to to pivot their core creative skills and and really into the world of industry while at the same time, people always want to hear this, how they can accelerate their musical careers. Christopher, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here. How did you get started in the business? Were you a working musician or what inspired you to get into this crazy world we call the music industry? Oh, that had to be my dad. I'm, I'm a product of Italian parents, and dad in the household always played opera, of course, Italian minstrel music of our culture, and American jazz, love jazz. He was born in the swing era, so naturally he wanted to be you know, a great trumpet player and gave up music and sacrificed it to raise a family. There were nine of us living in at one point with my grandmother from Bologna, Italy, and her daughter – and uh, four sisters and myself. So it was a big household, and the typical expression that governed our philosophy was, a tavola non si vecchio mai, a table no one grows old. Wow. And somehow, Dad handed me a guitar at four and a half, and I rebuked it. And the story goes that six months later, he handed me the guitar, and I had remembered the one four five chord. He thought that was unique. And, and for some reason, at that time, six months later, that sound of the guitar just transformed me, and I was set on a path, uh, and I never looked back. By the time I was nine, I was playing professionally with the Mike Morris Quintet. We had played at a bunch of places in, in New York City and Long Island, and was developing my skills really as a street musician. So the cultivation of being a world guitarist, world music guitarist, a guitarist who played, of course, our folk music, American jazz, but started to gain a proclivity for other types of ethnic music, tango, gypsy, flamenco, really started to integrate into my vocabulary as a, as a performer. And then as a uh, composer, I started composing at around 11. And before okay, you knew wait it, a minute, time out here. You started composing at the age of 11? Correct. Wow. That's, that's like unheard of. It was, you know... <laughs> My father didn't know what to do with me. He was a post office man. He worked in the time when you could, you know, Bob, years ago, work a a daytime job and a nighttime job was at mobile gas station. For for 38 years, he worked these two jobs. So he didn't know what to do with me and he didn't have the money trying to feed so many people to do something about it. But I probably was some type of a prodigy. And by the time I had – I was in my teens. I knew I wanted to go to a serious school of music. And so I I became a clammer in Long Island and and offshore, you know, uh, clams and sold them at the dock for like $60 cash uh, for about 450 clams in an onion skin bag. And that's how I raised the money to go to the conservatory in Boston to study seriously. What a way to put yourself through school by being a clammer. That's I've got to say, it's probably one of the more unusual occupations (laughs) we've heard about. Well, I have to say that in order to pay off the student loans after college, I borrowed from sheer uh, osmosis my mother's marvelous Bolognese cooking and went to Remax and said, listen, you, you need a personal chef for all the homes you sell. I'll cook you lasagna and rustic Italian salad and bread and for all of your, you know, your real estate brokers. And um, they allowed me to do that. I cooked for about 70 different real estate brokers and handed my card out, and I paid off my student loans by being a personal chef. Oh, my goodness. So I was always this entrepreneur kind of a person. You know, I always had this predilection for other things besides music, you know. And, and I love how you approach 
not only life, but approach how you want to further your career. I love that you weren't a guy that was looking for handouts or even hand ups. You were just looking for opportunities. And you're right. It is that that true entrepreneurial spirit to be able to what can I do to get you know, a little farther down the road to get my foot in the door, who would have thought of creating yourself as a personal chef for, for really such a unique market as 70 realtors? I've always wanted to, in a sense, pay, pay my bills in creative ways. And I don't know where that comes from other than I was so grateful to dad for the sacrifice he made to give up music to raise a family, I took it very, very seriously. I worked very, very hard. And I, I knew he couldn't bear the burden of finance and my education. And I, I, looking back, I wouldn't have it any other way, Bob. I'm assuming that your work ethic came from, from your dad. Very much so. He, he's today 90 years old. In that generation, men were their own factotums. He could do anything. His goal in life was to retire at 57 to exercise about 11, 12 different marvelous hobbies that I would have to say border on the professional, whether it's gardening, oil painting, doing the New York Times crossword puzzle in less than 10 minutes with a clock to make sure he does. Oh, my gosh. He, he's a man of incredible skill sets. He's truly a renaissance man and, uh, and a musician, of course. He taught himself flute, piano, guitar. He's also a Korean War hero with, with two Purple Hearts, and I think the discipline, the work ethic is magnificent. At 90, he still walks six miles a day. Good a day. for him. <laughs> Back east, and he's been married 68 years to beloved mom, so I really came from a very, very good family. I'm very grateful. You did, without any hesitation. That that's That is just inspiring. And with that being said, then... Did you start this company that you have now, or what was your journey to get there? That's a good question. I, I was very fortunate to win the Henry Mancini Scholarship for film, and that took me to California from Logan Airport. Never forget the day. And I had a chance to work with this great, great man. And part of the scholarship was getting my MFA at UCLA, study with him. And uh, he navigated me at CBS, so I started composing while still a student for shows like Dallas, Knott's Landing, Paradise, getting an Emmy nomination in 1987 for Paradise for a particular show called The Ghost, The Ghost Dancer. And it was at that time that I just – this is what I wanted. I, I was – I knew – I was set for a career. There were no inhibitions. I had no barriers. My mindset was very, very, very strong. And I wanted, there was one goal I had was to get my father's name in lights. Um, and mm. I saw Hollywood as a means to do it. Uh, so I learned a lot of things from Mancini. One of the things he told me was to diversify yourself as a musician. Around right, right in the mid 90s. Now I had graduated with my MFA in 1991. So right in the uh, mid 90s, I had um, after there was a uh, the Japanese financial crisis, but I was developing my own self publishing company online, and I, had, of course, published and composed the music of my ethnic background. I started to experiment, like I said, with world music because it was a theme in childhood that continued to show remarkable stability over many years. So I developed the publishing company with different categories or libraries of ethnic music: tango, gypsy, flamenco, world music, jazz, etc. And it was a turning point when Sheridan Stokes, one of the greatest recording artists in the Hollywood industry, eight years in a row won the most valuable recording artist in Hollywood as a flutist. He said, why don't you – these tangos are marvelous. Let's put out an album called Torbellino and we'll have 10 flute guitar albums and we'll take him to the National Flute Association, which is this convention that travels around every year to different locations. And it is a giant flute community. I had, I had no knowledge of this until Sheridan introduced me. So I took my tango dancers to Arizona. And what's remarkable about Arizona's convention centers, they got this Rococo-styled opera house, which was perfect for my tango dancers and flute and guitar. About 2,200 flutists were in the audience. And I sold 150 CDs and about $5,000 worth of sheet music. And three distributors came on board immediately to carry my products. And that's how the publishing company was born. This is 1998. And we've been strong ever since. We are now have about 350 publications we distribute digitally worldwide. And our focus is the flute community. But of course, that's branched out to other other types of musicians. You have eight different brands under your umbrella. Is that correct? I, I have eight categories or libraries of ethnic music within the publishing company. 
And I want to dig into those after we come back from our break and get a word in from our sponsor. We're going to have some more conversation here with Christopher Caliendo uh, with Caliendo World Music Publishing. Hey, this is Gary Chapman, and you are listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us, and it affects our everyday lives, whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, Christopher Caliando is with us, the founder of Caliando World Music Publishing. What we talked about in the very beginning of the show of of educating the musician on really how to pivot, which I guess is a key word here, how to pivot their core creative skills into the world of the music industry and and accelerating their careers, especially with everything that has gone on literally in the last 12 months, almost to this week. Uh, is that possible to really to accelerate your career in this music climate these days? That is a very large question. And I'm going to try to keep as cogent as possible for our listeners. But first explain something autobiographical that pivoted me into creating the 2D Academy, which is part of one of the subsidiaries of Kelly and Ormus Publishing. And that was uh, right after that Japanese financial crisis in 1997. I had uh, an, ex- an extraordinary career, a very colorful life. I've, I was the chosen performer for Bob Hope's 90th birthday. I've worked with Barbara Streisand, Julie Andrews. I've recorded with Manhattan Transfer. I mean, it, it goes on and on. My music's been played at the Hollywood Bowl. I've conducted all over the world. So it's it was an, it's been a wonderful journey. And suddenly... I get commissioned by John Paul II, and I'm living in the Vatican as the first American composer commissioned by John Paul II for a sacred music contemporary festival held in Rome, and no American previous had ever been commissioned. And I came back after that extraordinary experience, and Henry Mancini said to me, cultivate this to the deepest level possible. This is your one-line resume. This is your West Side story. Yeah. I got commissioned a second time came back on the cover of the New York Times, LA Times, and I met Steve Bender at UCLA, who was uh, where Jan Robertson, the conductor and dean of the college, was kind enough to premiere both panels, both commissions back to back for a concert. And in the audience was the legendary director, Steve Bender. This is the man who revised Elvis Presley's career in 1968 with the Elvis Presley comeback special. He directed Michael Jackson in that fantastic Super Bowl halftime, a real specialty director in the Hall of Fame. And Steve got um, with he got together with me at his beach house, and we we t- assembled a group of four Emmy Award winning team: Albert Fisher of Fisher Merlis Television, whom I already worked with on the Secrets of San Simeon Castle, scoring that with Patricia Hurst. Uh, Charles Lissenby, who created the set designs for the Radio City Music Hall Easter Christmas shows, as well as the Crystal Cathedral. So it was a great team, 32 Emmy Awards in all between us. And I tried to mount it and made the biggest mistake in my musical career. 
I invested my own money to do it. And we're talking six figures, lots of money. And um, I was just I, I was I was on a mission. I, I saw this as the opportunity of a lifetime. And after uh, the Japanese financial crisis and PBS changing their basic platform. In previous years, you could go to PBS and they would maybe finance a portion or all of the master and they would distribute it and have exclusive rights. And in this particular instance, they had changed it. So now you had to produce the master yourself and bring it to PBS. And the Jubilee year 2000 is when we wanted to mount this special. At the time, I called it the Mystic Saints. I lengthened the work to it was a two hour spectacle. And, uh, it didn't happen. I panicked. I went to Utrecht, Holland to mount it there. I tried to mount it in New York City at um, uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. I tried to mount it at the Nassau Cathedral here in Los Angeles. And I exhausted myself, had a major identity crisis, and uh, sought counseling for a year. And when I emerged from counseling and rewired my mindset, I opened up the newspaper. And in the L.A. Times was an advertisement to work at Manufacturers Bank as a telemarketer. And I said to myself, what better place to learn wealth management than a commercial bank because I don't want this to happen to me again. So it was part-time work and it paid very well and I got the job, of course, but I led the telemarketing division five years in a row in sales and found I had a very strong gift for sell, for sales and I had a gift for storytelling and I had a gift for time management and I had a gift for attention to detail and I had a gift for communication and all these gifts were necessary for me being successful in the bank selling bank products with an invisible handshake through a phone to CEOs of middle market companies whose annual sales range from 10 to $150 million. And that's what set me on this diverse path. And the biggest challenge I had, Bob, was walking in Hollywood with a suit and tie and being noticed that I'm no longer – or not no longer a musician, but – with a suit and tie, signifies something else. So sure enough, this self-esteem crisis I had, because my whole life had been music, was cha was challenged when Albert Fisher walked into a Barnes & Noble flagship store in Hollywood, where I had stopped to get a couple of CDs and a suit and tie, and his wife, Ricka, was with him, and Albert walked up to me and said, what's the suit and tie for? And, and, and not a man prone to lying, I said, well, I, I'm working at a bank. And Ricka came up to me, his wife put her hands on my shoulders and said, Good for you. And that demon left. And I realized it's okay, man. It's really cool to work somewhere else to support your musical education. Well, years later, I'm looking back. I had rose to the top of that profession as director of business development for a $16 billion asset at bank. And I had acquired and cultivated an enormous network of CEOs top business people, wealth management executives, networking gurus, and I had this other Rolodex and that the knowledge gained, the experience that I, I learned contributed greatly to accelerating my business in music and my musical career. I now had exposure to this culture and I had friends in this culture and I had people who could advise me and that's ultimately what shaped and created the 2D Academy, my online music school. And I think that's that seems to be one of the really large missing components when it comes to the artist today is, yes, we can call it that entrepreneurial spirit, but also understanding the finances of what it takes to get into the business and stay in the business and excel in this business. So true. That's why today's music educational systems the, are, are in crisis. And they feel the crippling effect of not just where this has led to. Now, I'm speaking specifically to the classical musical marketplace. Over the last 50 years, we have increasingly been living in a more materially abundant world. Today, anything is available. Everything's accessible. For example, there was a time when there was no jeans. We now have, what, the choice of hundreds of brands, colors, and styles. That's just jeans. But while I was at banking, I read Daniel Pink's seminal book, A Whole New Mind, published in 2004. And he states, if I can get the quote right, the, the paradox of prosperity is that while living standards have risen steadily decade after decade, life satisfaction hasn't budged. That's why more people liberated by prosperity but not fulfilled by it are resolving the paradox by searching for meaning. In other words, 
uh, abundance has produced an ironic result. The very triumph of left-directed thinking, the bankers, the lawyers, the computer coders, has lessened its significance. For business, it's no longer enough to create a product that's reasonably priced and adequately functional. It must be beautiful, unique, and meaningful. This is the shift that started right-brain dominance from left-brain analysts. The two shifts that greatly affected today's era of right-brain dominance are – outsourcing and automation. Mm. So the white collar, left brain analyst, lawyer, computer coder is now being offshored. And to replace that because of market competition, you have creative aestheticians who are in demand by corporations today. Musicians today have very little knowledge, depending on where they are in their career, of the enormous opportunities and options they have and how their gifts are in demand. These are soft skills. Now the academics like to call them creative core skills. So the MBA or the MFA, excuse me, is the new MBA. Harvard's MBA program admits about 10% of its applicants, while UCLA's Fine Arts Graduate School admits 3%. Why? Because the MFA is one of the hottest credentials and corporate recruiters have begun visiting the top art and music schools because of outsourcing. Many MBA graduates are becoming this century's blue-collar worker. These were the paradigm shifts that motivated me to create the Academy for Musicians to give them training, especially, well, if I may say there are two audiences, two likely candidates for members into the academy. First, the musician, and you're right, Bob, who wishes to pivot or apply their creative core skills learned in college into the world of business. From this position in life, those creative people who haven't had successful careers, but who, who have had successful careers in creativity, but COVID and other disruptors such as the Great Recession, and let's face it, let's go back to Lebrecht's seminal publication, Who Killed Classical Music in 96. They've all combined the amelioration of the classical musical marketplace. Now, this audience are now seeking a sustainable life. They're at a place where they may be thinking of marriage, children if applicable, and now, due to practical and biological initiatives, are looking at the second half of their life. The question how do I navigate the world and pay for my fixed and variable costs? This audience is not interested in going back to school to get a degree in business or finance. They're interested and looking to use the creative core skills into other industries to secure their financial stability while working on the thing they love to do the most. And that's what's so interesting is that I've been one of these people. I've been a musician of, of a very high experience, very broad in experience, who has had a double life moonlighting as a banker and gained significant knowledge to help accelerate my musical career. And now I can share that asset, redirect the mindset, newly rudder the ship of the musician today who would not be opposed to working a daytime corporate job. And we train musicians to make sure they find a corporate job that corresponds with their musical vision. That is a key to helping them accelerate the vision. The other audience for the academy are the young musician who is adapted to accepting the current pain points facing today's classical musicians, the lack of jobs, anxiety over student debt, concern or whether the technologies learned in school can be applicable after they graduate. And believe it or not, Bob, life balance. Ex-generationers are concerned about life balance, how to have a sustainable life. So these young musicians are looking for online education that can teach them entrepreneurial skills, business finance skills, marketing, branding, techniques in establishing their unique identity to help lessen the years of stagnation that can occur, let's face it, from not only marginalized thinking, but the current westernized music school system where you gain valuable technical training, but no preparation in such big issues as life balance, the reality of the job market, student debt, and technological paradigm shifts and other disruptors. That's a big spoonful of information to have to be able to swallow. Okay. <laughs> I, tried, I tried my best. I was saying it's, it's a big question you asked me. So, yeah. you know, I, no. It's definitely not an easy answer these days, once again, especially with everything that has been thrown in front of our industry in the last 12 months. We're going to take a break, get another word in for another one of our sponsors. And when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about 2T, your online learning program that you have as one of your brands. In the studio with us today, Christopher Caliando with Caliando World Music Publishing. Hey, this is Michael Omardian, and you are listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Are you curious about Gordon Lightfoot's songwriting process or what it was like working with Prince in the 80s? 
Have you ever given any thought to what goes into a golf course design or writing a book? I'm Steve Waxman, the host of The Creationist, a podcast about people who create. Each episode features a different creator sharing stories that I hope will inspire your own creativity. The Creationist is available now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, Christopher Caliando, the founder of Caliando World Music Publishing out of San Dimas, California, is with us today. We have talked a lot about everything that we can that the artist, the, the musician needs to do to further their career. Let's talk a little bit about how they can do that. And, and I guess the first place to start is your 2T online learning experience. Yeah, the first thing we do is start with the chassis of the individual. One of the things that for some reason is not focused on in school and training, formal training, is your identity. You know, we can't help it. We're part of a Western culture. We seek to emulate. That's kind of how we start our careers, I guess. But many of us suffer from emulation and the distraction and attraction of social media. And, but very few of us are aware of techniques that can get the absolute chassis, the identity towards the autonomy of each of us. Each of us is unique. So I teach three techniques that work on establishing your identity. And from the identity, from your knowledge of your purpose, everything else follows, Bob. Your marketing, your website, the music you play, the clothes you wear. So what are these techniques? So the first one I teach is themes. It's remarkable that all of us have these themes in childhood that show remarkable stability over many years. They're perennial in nature. And I was working with Jackie Chan once uh, on a film, and I asked, when I meet superstars, I say, you know, what, what are the things in childhood that have shown remarkable stability over many years? And Jackie said, well, I was born in Beijing, China, got into, obviously, acrobats and working with my body physically, and then I saw The General starring Buster Keaton in the seminal si uh, silent film uh, movie, and I fell in love with comedy and filmmaking, and then I saw Bruce Lee and Enter the Dragon in 1973, and I just, I just combined martial arts, filmmaking, and comedy into who I am. Mm. And that was a huge moment for me. That was a light bulb. And I went, oh, my goodness, can that be taught? Can that be acquired? Can that be learned? So I started the idea, which now is the 2D Academy, by going to colleges and junior school, junior high schools and, and talking about this. And I remember one day uh, there was a particular young uh, Japanese-American girl who heard me speak shy during the Q&A, but afterwards came up to me compulsively and said, I love what you talked about. And, and I said, well, what are the things in childhood that you that we really still love? You know, well, I love the human mind and I love the piano and I love late 19th century romantic music. And I said, well, let's combine them. What do you see? Now, this is a, a, a shift in consciousness because you've never been asked this question before. And so by the end of that little five minute, that little talk, she said, I see myself studying the composers and getting into their mind and uh, on why they wrote a piece of music. And I see myself actually talking to the audience and maybe not playing an entire sonata, but just one movement. And I said, now, here's here's someone where a typical pianist would play a full work, not communicate with the audience, leave the stage, take a bow. Now she's opened up this door to cultivate the things that make her unique and she is impassioned by. Wow. And we have this huge open door. Now, we, we set this as a precedent. You walk into the academy, you're going to be hit with a course that I actually include for free. It's a $250 course called Identity Towards Autonomy. And in it are our techniques to, to get to these themes, have the student walk through these sessions where they're actually integrating these themes, and to get a new sense of purpose and identity in their vision as a creative person. Um, they also encounter sentence stems. This is a technique where they a sentence stem, a typical sentence stem, Bob, would be if Bob says to himself one day, if I added 5% more awareness to marketing my podcast, I would. So sentence stems start with an initiative and end with a proactive. The important thing about this, this particular study is that you're going to answer very, very quickly. You're not going to dwaddle. You're not going to take your time in answering because that's when we get lazy and irresponsible. You answer very quickly for a period of a week. Go back and take your top three answers. That's what you need to do to solve the issue. 
And all of these synthesis stems have to be customized for each musician because each musician is different. They have different strengths and weaknesses. So we start with identity. We have a curric- various curriculums. So if your interest is jazz studies, if your interest is in marketing, if your interest is in branding, if your interest is in pedagogy, if you're interested in technology, how to create a tour using social media, there's a variety of curriculums. Once they click on the curriculum, they get a variety of content, whether it's an e-audio book, our web, our web TV series, which is an hour-induced documentaries on some of the most famous musicians giving their success stories and their life stories and tips. We have a one-to-many Zoom call where actually I meet once a week with everyone in the community at the academy answering questions, and I fly in CEOs of major companies to talk about branding, networking, entrepreneurship. We actually have Franklin Covey, uh, Covey, the school started by Stephen Covey, the, endorsing our, our program. So we fly in executives from them to help them develop their entrepreneurial skills. Uh, all the basics, right through how to create an effective resume, how to create an effective LinkedIn profile. So it, it really takes the student through a plethora of two divisions of thinking. They're going to have access to great musicians, have current events, trending events, success tips worldwide, Paris Conservatory, Milano Conservatorio di Musica, Juilliard. And on the other hand, they have access to the CEOs who are adjunct faculty who teach them the business skills they need. So they don't – they can use the membership and not have to go back to college with the onerous you know, idea of getting a business or finance degree, which is very expensive. And they don't really need that type of deep dive. Many musicians I work with uh, just need the basics. They need to be mentored and, and, and held their hand through this. But everything is dependent on their identity. Hmm. We don't we don't look for emulation. You know, well, I want to I want to be Hans Zimmer. No, you don't. You want to be you. When I was a little kid just starting to compose music, I told my dad I want to be the next Verdi. And he said, be the next Caliendo. Verdi's already been. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some truth to that. You know, yeah. we, we live in a culture where emulation and, and everyone's interested in, you know, I mean, how many of the Facebook posts we put are the ideal photograph. And we're so concerned. About, we're so conscious of how we look and feel and talk. But if you get rooted and get comfortable, there's an author I, I read. And I noticed that. Water is a theme in all of her books. I did a deep dive and found out she was born on a beach house. So there's some real sense to this clarity and high consciousness that evolves from going back to childhood and saying, oh, here's, here's an excellent example, by the way, that I did to myself just a, just a year ago. I did the same exercise because you have to do this exercise periodically because of the disruptors that come into our life. I said, well, list three things, Kelly Endo, you love to do. All of a sudden, reading comic books popped up. So I said, reading comic books, composing music, and learning more about electronic music. I combined them. And in that instance, I I went into my archives and pulled out a comic book called Shi, S-H-I, Japanese warrior that my buddy Billy Tucci wrote as a comic book entrepreneur 25 years ago and is celebrating the 25th anniversary of this character. I pulled out the comic book, Bob. And the opening monologue talks about the samurai in 17th century feudal Japan. And I recorded my voice, scored it, took, filmed the opening pages and flew it into, you know, editing software and sent it over to Billy in Long Island. And I said, what do you think? And he was astounded. And there was a paradigm shift that always existed for me that I never capitalized on, the whole notion of scoring comic books, which created another company called Intermedia, where we score art books. And we help publishers sell their books by enhancing the love and beauty of the art with an original score and, if necessary, voiceovers. So it's amazing the paradigm shifts that can occur and excite someone by getting to the chastity of who we are, getting to that that love language, and not being inhibited by saying, you know, it's pretty cool to actually take comic books and mesh it with music and maybe making gelato ice cream. How do we create those things to, to make us – it affects our blog. It affects our personality. And you'd be surprised. You know, listen, the end result is a great quote from Dante. Segui il tuo corso, ma lascia, ma lascia, lascia dire i genti. That's the old Latin Italian. But it basically means follow your course and let others talk. And I think that's where we need to be as a culture. Follow our course and let others talk. I 
could not agree more. I, it, and we hear this every once in a while. People will email us and say, hey, I'll, I want to be the next so-and-so. And, and I love what you said. No, you don't. You want to be the next you because the other pair of shoes have already been worn. The, the emulation, uh, to me, is saturated this world to where almost to the point where I think so much music sounds the same. It's, it's time to be an original and get out there with original thoughts and ideas and inspiration and inspire someone else in the process because of you, not because of someone else. Beautifully stated. I, I can't agree more. The paradox here is that if you and I, Bob, sat down and said, what are our 10 favorite pop music you know, songs of all time? I guarantee you every one of them broke the mold. Guarantee. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. W- without hesitation. Right. We just talked about the who. I don't know whether it was on camera or off camera, but uh, there's an exemplary band that has their voice, their unique style. I mean, that's what you, that's what branding is. Branding is a motive. What one word would describe Yo-Yo Ma? What two or three? I guarantee you his marketing engineers who surround him are, are, are making sure – we teach, we teach branding in the school too – that you have to ultimately – when you find your chassis, who you are – these word, these keywords will pop up in defining you to help market you, of course. But you should have two or three words that really identify with your personality as a musician. And the first thing you should do is reach out to your culture, your family, your friends and say, what two or three words really do you think kind of respond with my personality and start working this branding idea? No doubt about it. What breaks the mold is what's sustainable. I, Beethoven. I, yeah, I couldn't yeah. agree more. Yeah, yeah. Beethoven, Beck. 10 cc joe cocker uh you know jeff beck. N- yeah yeah oh. jeff beck yeah uh nelly oh. bell anybody you know uh, it's just yeah it's those people that create they set the bar for others to achieve i i have to say you need to set your own bar yes sir and and setting your own bar starts with the topography of your soul Know thyself. It goes back to Hellenistic Greece, the Delphi at Oracle, the Oracle at Delphi. You walked you, before you walked in, and you put your pledge, your treasures, or your uh, your gift to the Delphi, the Oracle, right above there, chiseled in stone. Know thyself. And we've got to get back to those ancient Greeks who knew it better than we did. You know, you walk into Barnes and Noble today, and two thirds of the books are self help books. How can people find you? Very easy. Um, again, you know, ChristopherCaliendo.com. The 2D Academy is the number two, the letter T, Academy.com. If they want to consult with me, a free 45-minute consultation, they can access that through the 2D Academy.com website. And more than happy to hear their top three pains and how I can help them overcome them. Excellent. Great information. Thank you so much. Just a pleasure, Bob. I I very much enjoyed this. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan.
You're out. Finished. Expelled. I want you off this campus at 9 o'clock Monday morning. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds.